Why don't we begin in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, we come before you this morning, um, desiring to know you better, your Son better, your Spirit better, uh, our church better, Scripture better. Help us to know how Scripture and tradition work together to bring us to salvation and uh, give us hearts and minds open to receive all you want to teach us today. Bless us with an abundance of your spirit, and we place this morning in Mary's hands as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, usually we start with uh, any questions, and Zach had a question already asked to him that he's going to answer for us. So, last class, I don't remember who exactly it was, but somebody asked me about the history of indulgences. And I was like, uh, I don't really know. <laughs> uh, so, I did a, just a little bit of research and wanted to share that. Um, so, if we're looking at kind of the scriptural roots. Uh, first, obviously, if we're talking about indulgences for the dead, then we would just look for things like praying for the dead. Second, or one of the book of Maccabees very clearly talks about prayer for the dead, so that's a, a great point to look to for that. Um, but indulgences in general, because they can be offered either for the dead or for ourselves. Um, some of the places we can look to, su to support that is like in um, the Gospels, where Jesus gives the, the apostles the power to bind and to loose. So normally we talk about that in terms of the forgiveness of sins, um, but we can also apply that to the uh, temporal punishment that comes from sins, because there's two aspects, forgiveness of the sin, but then also the effects, the temporal effects of the sin. Um, so that we also can look at in Corinthians. In the first letter of Corinthians, Paul basically assigns a penance to one of the members of the community. And in, this, in 2 Corinthians, he basically mitigates that penance and says, you know, if, if you, the leaders of the community, figure things out, I'm on board with you. You know, do, do what you think is, is necessary there. So those are just a couple of scriptural roots. Um, in terms of, of the actual development, for the first like, millennium of the church, we don't see a sharp distinction between um, sacramental, uh, the sacrament of of penance and indulgences as something separate from that. Rather, we just see this uh, the the church working out, you know, um, assigning a penance and mitigating penances uh, in connection with the sacrament of reconciliation. And then around the eleventh, twelfth century, you begin to see this distinction between sacramental penances uh, and the mitigation of sacramental of punishment through the sacrament, and then something separate from that indulgences where one can through a, you know offering a good work with the necessary conditions which includes a detachment from sin um, through a good work one can receive um, the mitigation of the temporal punishment of uh, of the temporal effects of sin through the merits gained by the church as a whole um, and we talked about how um, as a family you know the like uh, St. Paul tells us, you know, the, the, suff to, the sufferings of one is shared by all and the, the joys of one are shared by all. So in the same way, the merits of one is shared by all. Um, so we begin to see that in the 11th, 12th century, this uh, further clarification. And it takes a little bit longer for it to be understood of not only something that I can receive for myself, but something that I can offer for the dead, um, connecting that, you know, to prayer for the dead. Uh, so that's just a brief brief summary on the history of indulgence where we begin to see them clearly being talked about as something distinct from the sacrament of, of penance. So I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Other questions about last week? Okay. Uh, Jack, can you give me a handout? Oh, sure. Okay, so uh, this week we're talking about sacred scripture and the church. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit how they work together, and uh, then we're going to talk about 
um, the some guidelines in terms of interpreting scripture and uh, hopefully if we have time we're going to talk about um, why the church has seven more books in a Catholic Bible than there are in uh, than there is in a, in a Protestant Bible so hopefully we can move through things quick enough that we can spend some time on that um, but in terms of your study of the catechism you want to you can look at uh, eight, paragraphs 80 to 82 and then 105 to 141 okay uh, so tradition and sacred scripture is another way perhaps of saying uh, sacred scripture in the church in that our understanding as Catholics has always been that uh, you have scripture which teaches us about God, about salvation history, about the history of Israel, about the beginnings of the church, about the life of Jesus, you know, all the things that we learn in scripture. But then you also have the church who hands down from generation to generation, from apostles to bishops and onward, um, the deposit of the faith. So all the teachings that go along with scripture, the ways that we take scripture and we apply it to life, the ways that we take scripture and we apply it to our understanding of heaven, the way that we take scripture and we apply it to our understanding of what salvation requires, all those sorts of things. The seeds of all of that are in scripture, but being able to flesh it out fully so that it can be fully lived by us. Uh, Jesus gives us both scripture and the church. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but they both come from the same source. All right. They're both coming from God. The church is not a human institution. It's ma made up of humans. It's made up of sinful humans, but it's from God. Jesus established the church. Um, and Jesus established the scripture, Holy Spirit inspired the scripture, and so they're from the same source. And Pope Benedict and others have called it just like two streams from the same fountain, all right? And um, the Second Vatican Council, uh, De Verbum, so that the Second Vatican Council produced 16 different documents, and one of them, one of it was just on sacred scripture. So that, it was called Dei Verbum, or the Word of God. Um, says that those two streams uh, come back together a, as one. They flow from the same source and they uh, create the same river. Uh, but they're two distinct modes of transmission, okay? They, they rely on each other, but they're uh, both distinct. Okay, as, we're t as we talk more about, um, well, uh, let's just talk briefly about um, tradition, because, again, Catholics, we've always believed that you have both tradition and scripture. You have both the word and the interpretation of the Holy Spirit through the church. Our Protestant brothers and sisters, um, many of them, would believe in sola scriptura. All you need is scripture. There isn't this need for tradition. Um, and that is, is one of the main uh, points of difference between Catholics and Protestants. Um, but some things that, that have to be kept in mind are this. One, the church existed before the New Testament did, right? The first book of the New Testament wasn't written until about 50 A.D. Well, the church had been around since 30, 33 A.D. and spreading rapidly. Well, how did those people know God? How did they know salvation? I mean, it was being handed down verbally through the teachings of the apostles and the presbyters and those that they trained and, and, and ordained to do that. So, um, 
to say sola scriptura, you have to say, well, what, what about those first Christians? And what we know to be the New Testament may not have been finished being written until almost 100 AD. Um, so there are parts of scripture that the apostles never would have read. Uh, that um, the early Christians, yeah, would never even have seen. And to uh, go further, the, you wouldn't, um, how do we know which books are in the Bible? Which books should belong in the New Testament? Because uh, there were like 30, 32 some odd um, gospels written, but we only have four of them in Scripture, in the New Testament. Well, it was the church that determined which of those uh, were embraced by the faith, by the faithful, um, and therefore that they believe that the Holy Spirit worked through that to bring to the surface, these are the four that you need to keep. Um, but that itself was a, a process. And we see it in its final uh, conclusion. And again, if we are able to talk more about um, the differences between the two, uh, it was not until the 380s that, yeah, 382, um, Pope Damasus or the Council of Rome uh, said, okay, this is the canon. These are the books that are in the New Testament. Um, secondly, even Scripture itself um, when St. Paul is speaking to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, um, okay, so he says in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, um, Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions, traditions that you were taught, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. Okay, well, yes, we have the letters of Paul and the other uh, apostles that are in the book, but he's also talking about oral tradition, things that are spoken by the uh, bishops and presbyters of the church in that early church, which may or may not have ended up being written in concrete form in, in uh, what we know to be the New Testament. So even scripture itself, and you can also, just to finish that up, 2 Timothy 2.2. Um, 2. Hmm. Says, and what you have... What, in what you heard from me through many witnesses, entrust to faithful people who will have the ability to teach others as well. So this is, this is talking about an oral tradition, just like uh, the, the oral tradition of the church's teaching that has come down to us. So these are two uh, of various scripture passages that refer to a, a sense of not only the written word and that being uh, important for salvation, but also the tradition taught by the apostles, which is, again, handed down to the bishops generation after generation. Okay. Um, any questions on tradition before we uh, move more to sacred scripture and interpretation of it? You understand the difference between the two? So, like... Uh, the church is teaching on um, the Eucharist. I mean, you can look to uh, the three synoptics and their Last Supper discourses. You can look to the sixth chapter of John, and those give you the, the, the seeds of our understanding of the Eucharist. But that's been uh, very much uh, developed and blossomed within the teaching of the church over 2,000 years. Um, as we talked a few weeks ago, the understanding of who Jesus was as both Son of God and as man, divine and human, that was something that developed 
over time within the church and within the church's um, purview and, and um, privilege and, and responsibility uh, to help us to understand better what that means that he was fully human and fully God. Um, that doesn't mean that the early Christians didn't necessarily believe that, but they may not have been able to articulate it in the way that you could better articulate it in the 400s and 500s after you had had those various um, councils and all that. So, <clears throat> the seed of everything that we believe in tradition is in Scripture, but the church takes that Scripture and helps to flesh it out for us so that we can better understand Jesus, the church, and um, salvation and how we are called to live as disciples of the Lord. Father, yes. this may be a question for a whole other session. So are Protestant Christians who don't believe in Eucharist as we do, at what point did that separate us as a church? So, um, or maybe it's a wide question, I'm not sure. So. Right, so the question is, uh, the Protestant not understanding of the Eucharist not being the same as ours, when, when did that split? Well, that first began to split in the, um, I mean, really, the, you can go back and say that the Protestant split was 1517, when, when Luther separated from the church. And one of his, his teachings, uh, originally he taught that the Eucharist was what we believe it to be. He also taught that Mary is who we believe her to be. He also had uh, the seven books that eventually were kind of kicked out of the Protestant Bible in his, in his Bible. Um, but with time, his teaching developed to start to change some of that. So it was, um, it, it, it took a little bit of time for that particular teaching to split. Um, but the, the bigger issue was more, um, how did salvation happen? Or like, how do we in, in, encounter salvation? Is it through just faith alone? Like, I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe that he is my personal Lord and Savior. Or is, do I need to be being baptized and uh, receiving the sacraments and living, responding to the grace that I've been given, living a good life, doing good deeds, like all of that. That was kind of the primary split. And then these other teachings came as, is part of that. Does that help? Yes, it was great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, when we're looking at Scripture, uh, the first thing to keep in mind is Jesus is the Word. Like, He is the Word spoken by God. So, yes, the Gospels are about the life of Jesus, but the whole book is, is Jesus, is the Word, the Word spoken by the Father. Uh, which, again, the Son is a perfect reflection of the Father, you know, when we're talking about the, the Trinity. So he's revealed in all of Scripture. And we talked about that when we talked about um, the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit was revealed in the Old Testament, but the same thing can be said about Jesus. But, of course, he's most fully revealed in the Gospels, uh, but is intimately present throughout. So a few thoughts on Scripture before we uh, dive into how to interpret. Uh, first of all, uh, Scripture is an essential element of our faith. Um, we are not... I think I might have been um, guilty when I was a, a little kid of thinking, okay, what does the church teach? And then, oh yeah, we also have this Bible over here. I mean, I, I can't remember reading much of the Bible when I was a little kid, which was a travesty. I mean, because once I started reading, it's amazing, right? But um, we are not sola churchola, right? I mean, we like, we believe in church and scripture. So scripture is very essential to our salvation. Um, and St. Jerome, uh, De Verbum, quotes him, he says, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Um, our preaching, preaching that I do, uh, Deacon Tom, Monsignor, Father Justin, uh, the de teach preaching that Zach will do, any preaching must be based on the word. Uh, we should have a more intimate relationship with the word because of what is preached to us. 
Catechesis should be based on the Word. If you take your catechism and you look at the bottom, there are all these references to church documents, to the writings of the saints, and to Scripture. Okay? It's, it's just everywhere in the catechism. And then personal, personal prayer. Um, sometimes we pray more with um, maybe spiritual reading or whatever. Maybe we don't always feel comfortable praying with Scripture. And, and my prayer for you and for myself is that we always grow more comfortable with that because it's God's love letter to us. Um, but even if we're reading spiritual reading, that spiritual reading should be someone's reflection on Scripture. Like, it should all be going back to Scripture, ultimately. So, um, personal prayer, the Word of God, should be uh, present in that in some way. But interpretation is also important um, because we have 25 people in this room. We could take some passages and have 25 different interpretations of what exactly that meant. If you don't believe me, look at how many different Protestant churches there are. Once we separate from the idea that the church has been given the right and the responsibility to help interpret Scripture, once it becomes, no, the Holy Spirit's just going to work through me, well, then you got, you got issues. Because now we have thousands and thousands of different denominations. Um, and they would say, well, we all still believe that, you know, that faith is what saves us. But even how they understand that is different church to church. And so uh, that, that's what happens when you, when you give up this understanding of the need for tradition and the teaching of the church. Um, and it's important that we understand how the church interprets scriptures so that we learn to interpret likewise. So to do that, uh, I want you to remember one, two, three, four. So... What are those four? One, there's one primary author and interpreter of Scripture. Two, there are two testaments. Three, there are three criteria for interpreting Scripture. And four, there are four senses of Scripture. So one, there's one primary author and interpreter. Uh, in Scripture, God speaks to humanity in a human way. Um, if God were to just reveal himself as God, it would probably be in a language that we wouldn't understand. It may not even be in a language. I mean, it's, we can't really fathom on this side of the great divide, like what it's going to be like to experience God. Um, so God had to speak to us in a way that we could receive. But I think when we were talking about faith and all of that, we talked about how we were made to receive it. Okay, so it's not like, God made us and was like, hmm, how should, I inter how should I interact with them? Like, how do I talk to them? Oh, I'll, I'll come up with scripture. Um, no, he made us to be able to receive him through human understanding. And so scripture is able to speak to us through our human understandings. It's not in a completely unintelligible language. You don't need someone who's got some sort of special gift to be able to translate it for us. But, uh, and the Lord uses many, 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 many authors to bring about Scripture. But all of those authors are inspired by the Holy Spirit. My parents have a, uh, um, a picture up, a painting up that you could find in the Vatican um, and it's, the, it's an angel speaking to St. Matthew as he's writing scripture. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. It is pious. Um, and the scripture writers are in, inspired by, by God um, and by the Holy Spirit. But, but God's big enough and smart enough to be able to use the, the, the way that each writer would write um, to bring us the truths of salvation, meaning that um, it, it wasn't like, I'm going to write this because I've just heard someone whisper it in my ear. I mean, St. Matthew was writing what he had experienced 
and then other, other things that had come down from others, and he was compiling them all together in a way that he believed that his audience would understand. Um, but the Holy Spirit is using all of that to bring about what he writes down. So this isn't just some sort of pious, like the Holy Spirit standing on your shoulder telling you what to write. So uh, culture has something to do with it. And so I'm interpreting what you're saying, that culture, person's culture probably has a lot to do with what information you're giving them. Yes. But when when we, uh, and we'll talk, when we talk about um, uh, the four different senses of Scripture, the first sense is the literal. And to best understand the literal, you have to understand the culture in which it was written. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Dave Verbum also says that sacred, sacred Scripture must be read and interpreted in the light of the same Spirit by whom it was written. So the Spirit in, inspires the writing, but then also helps us to interpret it. Um, and uh, uh, I have in there just this little thing. So the Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Um, that's actually going to be, you can do your small group discussion based on that particular passage. But what happens? Jesus, in talking to Cleopas and the other uh, disciple, he interprets scripture for them. He looks back at the Old Testament and he says, look at how all of this points towards the Son of Man needing to suffer and to rise. So God himself interprets scripture for those disciples, which the Holy Spirit continues to do. But to give us confidence, um, the Holy Spirit does it through the church. So just, I mean, really, just imagine if you were given the Bible and say, okay, you figure out what God's saying. Don't worry, the Holy Spirit's going to inspire you. Okay, how do I know that's an inspiration of the Holy Spirit and not of some other spirit or just my interpretation? That's a lot of pressure. Holy Spirit doesn't want us to feel that pressure. Jesus doesn't either, so he gives us the church and, and, this, and scripture is born in the midst of the church because the church is the interpreter, the Holy Spirit's the interpreter through the church. Now, certainly the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking to us through scripture. And the Holy Spirit is going to help us to interpret scripture. But whenever we're like, uh, I, th I think that's the Holy Spirit speaking, I'm not sure. We can always bounce those interpretations uh, or what we feel God may be saying to us about Scripture off of the church's teaching. So if we have a, if we're, uh, let's say we're reading Scripture and it's talking about like the brothers of Jesus. And then we're like, well, that, that's obvious that, that Mary had other children. Okay, so, so that's, I feel like that's what the Holy Spirit is telling me. Well, that's not what the church teaches. And so, we can say, okay, that's not, that's not the Holy Spirit inspiring me to say that. Now, is that a difficult passage? Yeah, and the church is able to explain it for us. Uh, but whenever we have something that we feel like we're being taught by the Holy Spirit, we always need to check it off of what the church is teaching. Because again, the Spirit wants us to have the confidence to know uh, what the Spirit is truly teaching us. Okay, so there is one author... The Holy Spirit working through culture and circumstances and history and um, uh, modes of language. And then there's, and then that Spirit also interprets through the church, through uh, the teachings of the saints, through the teachings of the popes, through uh, various councils. Okay. There are two testaments. There's the old and the new. I know I'm not shocking you with that. Uh, but I, I gave you a canon of scripture. By canon, we mean the accepted, the accepted books of, okay? So there are 46 books of the Old Testament. Uh, for, I guess 45 of you, if, Karama, if Jeremiah and Lamentations are brought together. But 99.9% .9 of the time, I see them separate. 
uh, and then 27 for the new. Um, there's no debate amongst Christians about the New Testament so much, what books should be in there. Though there's debate certainly about what those books say, um, and there's a little bit of debate about James, but uh, the bigger debate is about the Old Testament. So we would say there are 46 books of the Old Testament. Um, Protestants would say that there are 39. Um, and again, hopefully we can look at this um, this second handout about um, why Catholic Bibles are bigger, but just very quickly, the books that are in question, Tobit, Judith, Baruch, Wisdom, uh, Sirach, and then 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And parts of Daniel and Esther, though Daniel and Esther are in both. Okay, so hopefully we can come back to that. Uh, but in all of this talking about the differences between how the Catholics view the Bible, how the Protestants view the Bible and tradition, let's say this, we can learn a lot from our Protestant brothers and sisters in terms of their genuine love for Scripture. Like I said, I grew up and I didn't read it. And sh shame on me for that. Um, and their desire to find the Lord in Scripture. That, those are two very important things that we can, um, that we, I, I think, uh, there's more of that in the Catholic Church now than there was before, but I think it is in a response to um, the inspiration that the, the, uh, the Protestants have, have given us. Uh, both Testaments are important and necessary. You can't understand Jesus without the Old Testament. If you could, then uh, Adam and Eve could fall, and what's to say Jesus, as soon as they were kicked out of the garden, Jesus didn't show up? I mean, why didn't he show up then? So that you wouldn't have all this time without salvation. Well, because his, his life and death and resurrection wouldn't make sense without everything that happened in between. His life, death, and resurrection don't make sense without understanding the Old Testament. The Old Testament is absolutely necessary for the New Testament. Uh, we are not um, Marcians, okay? So one of the, the uh, heresies of the early church was that um, you didn't, you didn't, the New Testament made the Old Testament void, unnecessary. No, that, that's a heresy. The Old Testament is very necessary. Um... But in terms of like the heart of Scripture, it's the Gospels, right? Because if, if all of Scripture is about the Word and the Word is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is most fully presented to us in the Gospels. The Word himself actually became one of us and was in our midst and lived a human life. And that's what the Gospels explain to us. And so we're not going to be able to encounter him, encounter him more fully at least scripturally, than we do in the Gospels. So everything, the, the Old Testament points to the Gospels, the New Testament um, builds from the Gospels, but the Gospels are the hinge of all of Scripture. Um, okay, and what I find is interesting, like oftentimes if you look at debates, theological debates between Catholics and Protestants, Catholics tend to quote Gospels more, and Protestants tend to quote St. Paul more. They're not in opposition, but uh, you'll find that for Catholic theology, the, the, the Gospels are very, very important. Um, and notice how we reverence the Gospels. Think about liturgies. Uh, if you went to Mass this morning, when did you stand? Stu you stood for the Gospel. Uh, if you were at the penance service last night, we stood for the gospel. Um, when we have feast days, we have a gospel procession. We don't have those same sort of things for the first reading or the second reading, but we have it for the gospel. Because again, it's a very critical aspect of scripture. Um, and my, once I did finally start spending time with the scriptures, especially with the gospels, my understanding and my love for Jesus just completely was transformed. So if you've never really spent time with the Gospels, start today. Pick up one of them. 
and just slowly read through it with the Holy Spirit. And we can talk more about how you could do that. But that's, and uh, Zach is teaching us that slowly. Okay, how are the Gospels formed? Three stages. It might be hard for us now in the modern age where uh, someone f famous or political or whatever can say something and 10 minutes later you can read about it on the other side of the world, right? Well, that, that's not the way things were at the time of the Gospels. So there are three stages. The first stage would be Jesus' life, him, him actually living out the Gospels. Um, the second stage was all of those who encountered him, especially the apostles, telling other people about it. And again, that happened at least for almost 20 years before anything was written down. And then eventually, when those early disciples were like, okay, Jesus talked about coming again, and he even made it seem like it was imminent. But it's been 20, 30 years now, and he's not back yet. And we're about to die. <laughs> we should probably be handing this down in a more concrete form. And so you have both the, the letters, which are more about Paul and the other uh, disciples writing to particular communities. Uh, but especially when it comes to the Gospels, it's like, okay, we've been talking about Jesus. We've been handing down these stories about him. But we got to write this down. Um, so... The Gospels were eventually written down, and Mark probably started late 50s, um, and Matthew and Luke uh, probably around the 70s, and then uh, John could be as late as the late 80s or 90. Now, some, some scholars will give you different timelines, but um, th they would all agree that the gospel wasn't Jesus writing about his life and then when he was done, he's like, here it is. It was handed on orally and then it was written down. Okay. Um, typology. Just a quick thing on typology. So you see in the Old Testament, we're given typologies of types of Jesus. Things that weighs... Uh, like a... Uh, an example of how Jesus was going to be is a very crude way of saying it. But, um, like, Jesus is king. But we can see the typology of that in David. Jesus um, is the final word on the law. But we can see um, a typology of Jesus in Moses. Because, uh, especially when you hear scribes or Pharisees say, well, but Moses said la 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 about the law but then you hear jesus say but i say so jesus is the new moses but moses was a typology a type of jesus um so in this, the old testament there are all these various uh aspects that are brought together in jesus um and he fulfills them fully in uh, in, in the Gospels, in his life, okay? Um, but it took, a, uh, it, again, it took a while, and you can kind of see even St. Paul, as you, if you looked at his writings in succession, how he grows in his understanding of how Jesus fulfills these types in the Old Testament, um, which, again, stresses why the Old Testament is very critical because it helps us to understand Jesus. Okay. Three, the three criteria for interpreting Scripture. First of all, be attentive to the content and unity of the whole Scripture. To completely understand God, salvation, Jesus, you can't just take one book. I'll just take the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke and I'll completely understand. Nope. Or I can't just make interpretations based on Luke without looking at the rest of Scripture. So first, uh, we have to be attentive that all of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it's meant to all be one thing that helps us to understand. Um, and so we have to 
interpret it based on the rest of Scripture. Second, read Scripture within the living tradition of the whole church. Like I said before, if you feel like the, the Spirit has inspired you to understand something about Scripture, it's good for us to bounce it off of the church's teaching. Um, in the church's tradition is the living memorial of God's Word, and the Holy Spirit inspires the interpretation. And then three, be attentive to the analogy of faith. Uh, so the coherence of truths of faith among themselves and within the whole plan of salvation. Scripture is not going to tell you something that contradicts faith in God's plan of salvation. Um, oh, I don't know. Like you, you're reading something and... Uh, you, Jesus talks about faith like a mustard seed. And you're like, okay, well then, to be saved, I need to eat more mustard. <laughs> someone might actually get there, right? I mean, someone might make that jump. Uh, none of the rest of our understanding of salvation talks about that, right? So we have nothing in Scripture is going to lead you to contradict salvation. Um, and uh, the, the faith in God's plan for salvation. Okay. So those are, those are actually really th three criteria that are in the um, catechism, and they're very helpful for us in our interpretation. And then number four, four senses of Scripture. So you have the literal sense, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the historical, meaning uh, the meaning that is conveyed by the words of Scripture. And the sacred authors, mean, we don't mean the Holy Spirit there by sacred authors, but like each author, so the author of Lamentations, the author of Deuteronomy, the author of the letter of St. James, um, their intention must be found through the conditions of their time and culture, the literary genres in use at that time, and the modes of feeling, speaking, and narrating that were then current. Okay? Okay. Uh, in the 1800s, there was a rise in biblical, uh, it would be called like a critical analysis of the Bible. Not like it's the Bible's wrong, sort of critical, but just, okay, what did that actually mean? Or what, what was the, that author really trying to get at or whatever? So in order to get that, we got to go back to their time and their genre of writing and all of that to better understand that. Um, now, it used to be that, I mean, for a long time, the literal sense was just taken as like, like that's exactly how it happened. That's historically exactly how it happened. Boom, boom, boom. All of these are just like uh, a historian perfectly writing down everything. But with research and our, under, our gr greater understanding of cultures and all those sorts of things, like we can understand better now that the literal sense um, isn't just a matter of taking scripture literally, um, but it's what is what are all the things that are behind what that author might have been experiencing or the culture that they grew up in in order to say what they say. But they're still inspired by God, okay? Uh, but then there are three spiritual senses. So there's the allegorical sense, which is... Christological, what's the significance in Christ? How does it point to Christ? How is the typology of Christ or his church? Okay? So allegory refers to the, uh, the Christ elements of it. The moral sense, or the tropological, how does this teach us how we are to act and to live justly? How is this teaching us how to be good disciples? And then the third sense the anagogical sense, the mystical. What is this telling us about heaven? What a, how is this um, helping us to view these events in terms of their eternal significance? So basically, you could say that the letter speaks of the deeds, so the, the um, uh, literal speaks of the deeds, the allegorical to faith, the moral how to act, and the anagogical is our destiny. 
Okay? Can you say that again? Yep. So the letter speaks of deeds, the allegory to faith, the moral how to act, and anagogy our destiny. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, so, how about an example? Um, <coughs> the cross. So, uh, Jesus is lifted up on the cross and dies. That's the literal sense, right? Jesus literally was nailed to the cross. The cross was put up. He hung there for three hours and he died. That literally, historically happened. And all four Gospels talk about that. But then you can look back to um, the... The Israelites wandering in the desert when, the, when God was upset with them and so he sent the serpents because they were complaining and some of them were dying because they were bitten by the serpent. And so what is, Mo, what is Moses told to do? He's the staff with the golden ster, serpent on it. And when you look at that, you're saved. Okay, well, when we see that and then we see Jesus being lifted up, hmm, Maybe looking at Jesus and his sacrifice for us can save us. So there's this allegory based on a, uh, an Old Testament typology of the um, serpent on the staff. And, that, and it, it also, we look at it, at Jesus on the cross and go, hmm, what does that mean for me as a disciple? Probably that I should do the same thing that I should give my life in service to others for the good of others. And then we know that it's only through Jesus' death on the cross that we are saved, that we have the opportunity to go to heaven. So you see the four senses there? The literal, Jesus is crucified. He literally is crucified. The allegorical, uh, this is uh, for our salvation because we can see it in the, the serpent on the staff that Moses puts up, lifts up. The um, moral sense, how, what does this mean for how we should live? Oh, we, should, we should be willing to, to make sacrifices for others. And then anagogically, salvation is only possible, heaven is only possible through the cross. Okay. Um... We are at 9.50. So um, I guess what I'll say is this. The, what, I, what I handed out to you, um, the, the second thing was from the 2011 Summer Education Series. Do you guys remember those? Back when I was an associate, we started doing summer classes. So some of you might have actually attended that class. Uh, where we talked about why are Catholic Bibles bigger than Protestant ones. Um, I just gave you the handout from that day again. So if you want to look through it, um, and if you, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some questions that you might have. Um, so if you have any of those questions, you know, write them down, and then you can ask them when we get back together next week. Uh, but I want to stay on time here and so I'm going to hand things over to Zach. I'm sure I don't think I got that. Did you hand that out before? Yeah, they're two different um, yeah. hands. Oh, then. Yeah. It's all together. Okay, I got, I got the chunk. That's right. It's all together. Great. All right, so we're going to flip to the very back page. I think Father Scott's uh, presentation leads really really well into what I was gonna gonna uh, discuss today so a couple of weeks ago we were talking about the importance of mental prayer uh, med meditative prayer uh, and how that's kind of a keystone in the spiritual life spending time in silence reflecting on the truths of our faith so that we can fall in love with them and they can transform our hearts um, so last week <clears throat> I presented one method that we can use for that um, the four R's simply reading and reflecting upon 
you know, scripture or some other form of reading, uh, spiritual reading. I'm spending time in silence, speaking with the Lord about it, and then forming some resolution that I can transform, that allows the Lord to transform my life through that. Um, today I wanted to just present briefly a, another method of uh, meditative prayer we might, might use. Um, and a, as a general comment, I think I said this last week too, the method is not what's important. The relationship is what's important. The method can just be helpful for us as we approach our time of prayer. Um, just like if we think about most of our interactions with a friend, it, it's very natural, but there tends to be kind of a structure to those interactions. I see them, I shake their hand. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? What's going on? So we start kind of on this level and then we slowly work our way down. How's your family doing? And, and our conversation gets deeper and we start speaking more heart to heart. And then as we prepare to leave, you know, there's another sequence that we go through of like, all right, yeah, it's great to be together. See you later. Look forward to seeing you again soon. And we kind of leave that conversation through a similar structure. Right? So we can think about that same thing with prayer. The relationship's what's important. The method is just helpful for us in entering into that relationship. Um, so the second method I wanted to talk about is often called Ignatian, uh, Ignatian contemplation, or I like to call it Ignatian imaginative prayer. So I think that's clear. It's uh, focused on using our imagination to encounter the Lord. I gave a sequence of, of steps here drawn from St. Ignatius. Um, the, uh, yeah, and just going to move through them quickly. The, the preparation, so you know, at the beginning, uh, I pause, recall God's presence, recall his love for me. Maybe spend 30 seconds just thinking about how does he look at me. This was, as I was preparing this yesterday, I was like, yeah, I need to go back to starting my prayer with that. Just 30 seconds thinking about Jesus is looking at me. Um, so I, I start there. I ask him to guide all you know, my, my actions, my intentions, guide my time of prayer. And then I, I review the passage that I'm praying with. So I'm, if I'm praying with, praying with the passage of the Gospels, this is really a, uh, a great way to pray with the Gospels. But if I, I reflect on, oh, I'm praying with the storm at sea. Okay, what happens? They get in the boat, and then they start going across the sea. Oh, now there's this big storm. They go to wake Jesus up. So I just recall the kind of the storyline, right? And then I begin to, com uh, Ignatius says, compose the place. So I use my imagination to kind of paint the picture. You know, what do I hear? What does it look like? Who do I see? Who's in the boat with me? Where is Jesus? What does the sky look like? What does the ocean or the sea look like? So I, I use my imagination to create the place. Um, and then as I'm in that place, uh, I ask the Lord for whatever grace I desire in that time of prayer. Um, a beautiful grace to ask for is, Lord, teach me to pray. Um, but if, especially if you know, there's something that's related to that passage, I might ask for that. So praying with the calming of the storm at sea, like Jesus, I'm really experiencing a lot of distress right now. Please teach me to be at peace, trusting in your presence. Right? So some, some grace that I, I desire from that time of prayer. Um, so that's all kind of preparation um, and might just happen in a few minutes. And then I lead into the main uh, time of prayer. Um, and that's where I allow the scene to unfold. So I've created the place with my imagination. I've, uh, and a part of that is asking, where am I? Am I one of the apostles? Maybe in this, you know, whatever scene I'm imagining, I actually imagine myself as Jesus, uh, right? And that's a great, can be a great thing to do. If I'm in Jesus' place and somebody is coming to me, you know, as they come to Jesus, what, is, what does Jesus want to say to me in that? Um, is that like no, Lectio Novena? Is that, Lectio Divina. Yeah, that's what you're sure. telling us. Is that correct um, or wrong? This is a different, slightly different form of prayer, but similar. Yeah. Because I, uh, I participated in that once before, and that's what you're saying is what reminded me of that type of prayer. Sure, and yeah. It, it becomes like an individual thing. Right, allowing Jesus to speak to me personally, yeah. Um, so the main body of this form of prayer is just allowing that scene to unfold. I've created, you know, I've used my imagination to place myself in this scene, and now I just slowly allow it to unfold in my mind and in my heart, in my imagination. What is happening? You know, as the storm comes up, what do I feel inside? What do the apostles around me feel? Um, oh, you know, now we're afraid. Okay, what, what is it? 
when we go to Jesus, what did, how does he react? What does he say to me? What does he say to me when we wake him up? Um, so I allow this scene to unfold in my, in my heart. Whatever I'm drawn to, um, then I stay there. I, I can stay in that place. If I come to that part of the scene where I go to Jesus to ask him for help, and there's something that strikes me in that, then I can just stay there for the rest of my time of prayer. I, I don't have to get to the end of the, the scene. Um, but whatever strikes me, just stay in that place. Um, and then, so that's the main body. And then as I conclude my time of prayer, I turn to the Lord and speak with him about whatever uh, came up in my heart, whatever struck me, you know, sharing that with him, um, as I might share with a friend, and allowing him you know, to speak anything that he wants to into that, especially any way that he might want me to um, change in my life, form some sort of resolution to, to grow in virtue or to grow in my relationship with him. Um, and then I simply close you know, with, a, with an Our Father or a Hail Mary or Glory Be or some you know, other prayer um, to kind of bring my time of prayer to an end. Um, so that's Ignatian contemplation. Um, next week I'll present one, a third method of prayer that we might want to use. Thank you, Zach. So, so if you take your hand out, um, and uh, basically, if you go to the back and you flip one, one page in, there the, the, the reading from this weekend, the Gospel of Luke 21, 5 to 19. Um, and uh, then, so you could read that as a group and use those questions, or I pulled out, like I said, the uh, story of the road to Emmaus and then put some reflection questions on there. So whichever set you want to use is up to you. Um, but th before we close, are there any questions? Okay, cool. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.